Welcome to my spoiler-filled review for My Bloody Valentine, the 1981 edition. Yeah, I just thought to myself, well, it's only four weeks till Valentine's Day now. Ideal time to be reviewing this film. Actually, that's a lie. It's completely random that I'm reviewing this film now. I first got interested in My Bloody Valentine years ago when the remake came out. I watched that and I did enjoy it, although the twist spoiled it for me. There's a twist at the end that just changes the fabric of the movie. And I thought, oh, no, not for me. And I think that's why I've never gone back to that film since. But I've heard over the years that the original version from 81 is the better movie and it doesn't have that same twist. So I decided before Christmas to pick up a Blu-ray for this. Um, I do do that sometimes for films I've not seen, if the reputation of the film is good enough, which in this instance it definitely is. But unfortunately, um, it's very expensive in the UK to buy a copy of My Bloody Valentine on Blu-ray. It's like £55 even for a second-hand copy. That's like $70 in the States, I think. So I decided to just leave it, but this week, literally, I was checking Amazon Prime and suddenly it was on there. I can, I can watch it for free as long as I've got a subscription, so that's what I did. So the story for this takes place in a mining community off the east coast of Canada in a place called Nova Scotia. I didn't know that mining communities existed so close to the sea. I mean, what if the miners sort of lose their compass and accidentally dig into the sea? I mean... Seems a bit dangerous to me. But anyway, one particular year, five or six miners get trapped underground because of the incompetence of two people up top. This happens on a Valentine's Day, coincidentally. And everybody down below dies over the next five or six weeks as everybody else tries to dig them out. There's one survivor called Harry Warden, and he, he only, the only way he survives is by eating the other miners, basically. So when he comes out, he's so traumatised he has to go into psychiatric care. But a year later, on Valentine's Day, he returns, kills the two people responsible for what happened to him and makes a pledge that if the town celebrates Valentine's Day ever again, he will come back and kill more people. So the town actually takes him at his word and Valentine's Day is banned thereafter. But over time, 20 years to be precise, councillors change, the residents change and eventually... It's collectively agreed that Valentine's Day should come back and that Harry Warden is surely no longer a threat. But just as posters go up around town advertising Valentine's celebrations, etc, etc, murders begin to happen again and it's presumed that Harry Warden is back in town. In terms of the new twist we get this time then, I wasn't as offended this time around. I didn't mind so much the third or fourth person down the cast list being the killer compared to the main protagonist being the killer as it was in the remake. I still would have preferred a straight down the line horror film with no twist though because Harry Warden is such a cool villain in the early stages of this film as he is in the remakes. So this is twice now that he's not had his full services used. I think somebody needs to rectify that one day, maybe do a sequel or another reboot. So that's definitely my biggest negative on the film. The only other thing I would mention in an otherwise good film is the fact that the fight at the end on the minecart is painfully slow. I mean, it's like this. I'm going to get you. Oh, it's like, Jesus, couldn't they not have given these two a couple of rubber axes and then they could have been swinging them faster? The film takes place in a really desolate looking town. I didn't really fall in love with the overall location, above the ground anyway. It feels like the sort of town where a mine might have already been exhausted and everybody's already moved away. It doesn't feel like there's more than about 20 people for the whole town, even though there's a sheriff. I thought this might just be the film showing its cheapness at the time I was watching it, but later on... I looked at a map and it turns out that this little place where they did the filming is in a really remote corner of Nova Scotia and it, it looks like it might be the sort of place that would actually look like this really bleak looking. The film doesn't really take off until I'd say the party scene but there's still a good 40-45 minutes left by that point and it is a real thrill ride once the characters start to go underground. I don't know why anybody would want to break off from a night out to go down into a mine by the way. I mean it's a great place for a horror film but why would you go down there where it's all dark and drafty? If I'd have been in this film, I probably would have survived because I would have stayed in the common room, listening to music, having a beer and staying safe. Although I might have gone in the kitchen to sort of smell the food and ended up getting my head dunked in a pan for my trouble, I suppose. There are a number of effective scenes down in the mines, though. I mean, to begin with, just the slow descent down on the mine cart. It's really spooky. It's like they're riding a ghost train in a fairground or something. There's also a scene where some of the main characters are walking through a tunnel and then the killer starts knocking out light bulbs with his axe. And at this point, for me, I still thought it was Harry Warden, so that made it just doubly effective. Even better, there's an escape attempt by some of them 
up this vertical ladder. Now this would be an, a scary feat to try and pull off anyway, even if there wasn't a killer in their midst. But all the time I was watching these four guys and gals try and go up this ladder, I was just thinking that Warden was going to come out of nowhere and grab the bottom most one of them, a bit like Jason on that boat in Friday Part 8. Or it would turn out that Harry would be up top as if he would have predicted that they were going to go up this ladder because serial killers are really good at guessing what the, the good guys are going to do next, aren't they? So I was quite impressed with the film that it showed a bit of restraint and actually didn't kill anybody at that point. I've got to mention the ending as well. As disappointed as I was with the Axel reveal, I did think it was kind of cool that they let him sort of escape into the mine. I mean, if you just, just think about how the town's going to react to that, they're going to talk about that for like the next hundred years. Although, how is anybody supposed to go to work the next day knowing that Axel, the one-armed freak, is still running around down in that mine? I mean, he could have found his way back into the main network of tunnels somehow, and then everybody could be at risk. As for the characters who don't turn evil, I neither liked them or disliked them, really. When I look back on this film, I kind of think it was a cool stalk and slash film with a good atmosphere, but nothing in, in terms of the human drama has really moved me in any way. A couple of the women were decent, I suppose. I'm probably just saying that because they were hot, if I'm honest with myself. I did like the harbinger of doom behind the bar. He was quite entertaining. He reminded... Well, this is another Friday the 13th reference. He reminded me of Crazy Ralph from those early Friday films. Don't go into the mines! It's got a death curse! The love triangle thing between Sarah, TJ and Axel didn't do anything for me. These grown-up blokes just punching and shoving each other in front of a girl. It was a little bit pathetic. It was sort of like, come on, guys, there's plenty more fish in the sea. Well, actually, in this town, there probably isn't. Population's about 20. So, yeah, you duke it out. It might be 10 years of celibacy for the loser. I don't know why Axel was so keen to keep his girl, though. I mean, if he's decided on a life of being this, you know, dangerous serial killer floating around, then does he need to keep Sarah? Is he just planning on killing people every Valentine's Day while at the same time having this happy family life eventually with Sarah with the white picket fence and stuff. I think his motivations were a little bit muddled and I'm not entirely convinced either that watching your parents get killed by a serial killer will then make you a serial killer yourself, if you see what I mean. Some of the other characters, when it came to their death scenes, um, I wasn't sure if I'd seen them in the movie up to that point. So the kid who gets his face dunked in the, in the pot I watched that and I thought, is this your first scene? I'm honestly not sure. And I can give you other examples of that, actually. So possibly there were too many characters to try and keep track of. I think two or three could have gone and it wouldn't have hurt the movie. I think the sheriff was possibly miscast. He just came across as a bit soft. I'm not convinced I could have depended on him in a Harry Warden populated world. I was reading on Wikipedia about how apparently a few years ago, uh, some lost footage was added back into the movie, mostly extra gore shots. And that gave me the idea that possibly I'd watched the trimmed down version from old because it didn't seem like a violent film. So I went and did some more poking around on YouTube and sure enough, I was watching the censored version. I mean, some of the kills in the newly released version go on for so much longer than, than in the version I was watching. So just an example, the scene where there's a girl in this room and all these coats are sort of dropping down, which is a brilliant scene, by the way. In my version, Harry Warden or Axel grabs her and then lifts her up and then scene cuts but in the new version he grabs her and then carries her half the room and then impales her on this sharp thing and it, it's massively lengthened that kill so in the future if the blu-ray becomes less expensive and more readily available i was certainly buying I mean, this film didn't blow me away but I, I certainly enjoyed it enough that I might possibly consider owning it i'd love to see the version with all the gore back in Certainly be fascinating to watch a commentary or two. I also saw on Wiki that the director of this film went on to do Bullet to Beijing, which is a Harry Palmer film I've not seen. It was on the later ones that Michael Caine did. And he also did something called Black Christmas Legacy in 2015. Now, when I read that, I thought, well, what the hell was that? Was that like a, a Black Christmas fan film or something? Or maybe a planned Black Christmas sequel that didn't end up getting made? Because it's in red on Wiki. You can't click into it. There's no link. But... Um, I found elsewhere that apparently, no, it's not a movie or it wasn't a movie. It was actually a documentary about Black Christmas. So not missing much there unless you're into that. So to put a bow on this review, then it is a very good film. There's part of me that was maybe expecting a little bit more, given the incredible reputation of the film. I did wonder whether I was about to discover another absolute masterpiece that I would totally love and revere. It's not quite that. But I would certainly go back to it in the future. I think it has made me curious to possibly give the remake another chance at some point. Uh, so there we have it. Right, let's get to the Bag of Terror and see how that translates into a score. One, two, three, 
three and a half bloody axes for the original My Bloody Valentine for from 1981. Right, I will be back soon with another review. Until next time, cheerio, bye-bye. Mm.